Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome again to um, our seminary series on um, thinking as a Christian. Um, you can see in the background that I'm in the basement and I'm wearing a pair of sweats and I currently don't have my shoes on. I hope you guys are all comfortable. Uh, you can see the dartboard. It looks like somebody forgot to pick up somebody forgot to pick up a blanket. So we're a little cluttered here. Uh, but what I, the, the way I wanted to start this was, first of all, I'm going to pray, but um, I'm going to lay out some generally ge some general things. We'll talk about, you know, worldview. Everybody's got one. We're going to move into the facts that are the building blocks of a worldview. And then we're going to go look at some of the ways that we can identify what those facts of Christianity are. We're not going to get into super depth because of time. Um, if we had the, uh, the ability to have more classes, which we have been talking about doing in the future, um, we would be able to get into a little bit more depth. But what I wanted to do is be able to set the table for what Andy's going to talk about next, next time, and also to provide for you, hopefully, some, some general tips on how to uh, go after the facts of Christianity and recognize the, what, what are being asserted as facts of other worldviews. So um, with that in mind, let me, let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we know that your word is truth. Um, we know that because uh, the same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead and the same spirit that hovered over the waters uh, at creation uh, illuminated and convicted and regenerated us as, as human beings, we have been made new. And because of the spirit that lives in us and uh, abides in us, we, we know <clears throat> that your word is truth. And so, God, as we uh, discuss and talk today and as we live every moment of our lives, I, I pray for these folks. I pray for all of us and I pray for your church in general and New City Church uh, that the words that are from your mouth, from the eternal God, uh, would uh, would take root, and um, God, we'd be hungry for your word, and we would seek after it uh, to build our worldview uh, based upon your scripture, your word. And so, God, um, bless our time today. Uh, make my uh, presentation clear, and uh, may it be good for them, and uh, may it magnify and glorify or reflect your character. Uh, God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's kind of weird. This whole thing is weird. I like to be with you. Um, we like to be together um, in three dimensions where we can kind of feel one another, where this two dimension thing is, is, uh, is what we have, but it just feels weird. And especially now that I'm the only talker and I can't hear you. So uh, it's a little awkward. And uh, so bear with me through maybe some of what might be considered uh, uh, awkward by you. Renee just lost you. Hopefully you're still there. There you are. So I'm in the, I'm in the, uh, what's it called? I'm in the gallery view so I can see you all and that's the way I prefer it. So I'm gonna stick this way. But what I wanted to do is start off, I've got my notes down here and I'm looking at you all on the screen. The camera's right there. So um, this may seem odd, but let's just, let's just kind of bear with one another. Bear with me to begin with here. What I want you to do, please, is uh, open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 4, and just hold them there because uh, we'll get to them in the end, all right? So Ephesians chapter 2, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 4. So worldview, when you take a look around at the cultural landscape uh, in the United States, what do you see? Um, without being able to kind of banter back and forth here, I'm just going to kind of throw out some things that I see. And I see, uh, I, I see um, politics is on the forefront of the media. Uh, we have a, uh, an election that's coming up. We have obviously a pandemic that's going on and reactions and responses to that pandemic. Uh, the things that we've seen prior to the pandemic, we, you know, we've been dealing with uh, the thing that's been on my mind and probably yours as well, and, and that's abortion. We see um, 
we see same sex um, relationships being thrust down our throats, so to speak. Um, we're seeing transgender, we're, we're seeing so much on the cultural landscape. Um, we ought to understand that these things that are coming at us are built out of a worldview. They're built out of worldviews. Um, when you boil down um, worldviews, there are only really two types of worldviews. There's a God-centered or theocentric worldview, and then there's an, uh, a man-centered or an anthropomorphic, anthropocentric worldview. Those are the two that exist. Now, the God-centered worldview is biblical. It's a Christian worldview. The anthropocentric worldview or man-centered worldview is everything else. And we have been, we as a culture have been very inventive in the, um, a collection of what we might assert to be facts, to build logical um, assertions, which uh, inform and build worldviews. Um, what I wanted to start off with is pointing this out is, and that each one of you and each one of us, every single human being is a philosopher. Uh, we may not have studied Socrates or Plato or, you know, all the, the, the major philosophers and the, the, the high end philosophers in all of history, but every person is a philosopher uh, to a particular degree because everyone has a worldview. Uh, you have a worldview and it's been informed since you uh, were dropped onto the planet. You have been um, educated. You have received information. Uh, and based on your worldview, you have you've, you've run all that information and all the data through the grid of that worldview. And you have formed opinions and you have formed um, inferences. And it, it informs the way that you go about living your life. So if you look at the, I mean, if we, people know what a worldview is, I think, but if we want to break it down into some subcategories or maybe more of a description, we can look at it like this. Uh, uh, a worldview is a, it's a philosophical view of the world. It's not a, uh, obviously it's not a physical view of the world. It's phil philosophical and it's an all encompassing perspective on everything that exists and that matters to us. Um, a worldview represents the most fundamental beliefs and the assumptions about the universe in which we live. Um, it also represents how we answer the big questions of existence. And these are the things that, um, uh, uh, that lead us out into the world and cause us to think, to respond, to act. Um, the big questions are who and what am I? Um, why am I here? Where am I going? What's the meaning and purpose of this life? What counts? and matters in this life. Um, those things mean something to us. And, uh, you know, there, there are few people that actually think in that depth. And there's even fewer people that have come up with answers to those questions. But everyone has a worldview, which will incline each one of us toward uh, certain things and away from other things. It puts shape to our experiences as well. So whatever we experience, we run through that grid of the worldview and we, have, we are inclined one way or the, uh, or the other to either believe it or to act. Um, uh, a worldview determines our opinions on things like politics and ethics and, and so forth. Global warming, you know, uh, global type of economics, all kinds of other economic policies, education, um, things like I mentioned before, abortion. The things that are going on in our world, our worldview determines how we receive it and act upon it. So the worldview uh, plays a central, and I'm working off my notes here, plays a central and defining role in our lives by shaping what we believe and what we're willing to believe, how we interpret our experiences, how we respond to those experiences, and how we ultimately, how we relate to each other and to God. Um, so our thoughts and actions are conditioned by our worldview and how does the worldview operate? How does the worldview operate? Well, it, it operates individually, but it also operates on a societal level. Um, we can see it going on right now in the American culture within any society or within any, any culture. Uh, there are certain types of worldviews that will become 
uh, more prevalent. They'll rise to the top. Um, and for a long time in the church age or, you know, the church age, uh, when, when Jesus ascended, that inaugurated the church age. So we're in the church age. Uh, the Bible also says that we're in the last days. But since then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, within the church age, Christianity was a, was a dominant uh, uh, worldview in Western civilization. It's only been in the last couple of hundred years that, you know, competing worldviews have become prominent, and they are the isms. Uh, Pastor Aaron likes to, um, from the pulpit, I don't know how many times you've heard it, but I recall hearing it quite a bit. He talks about the isms and the asms and the spasms, all of the um, worldviews that compete for our attention and compete for dominance. So again, in the last few hundred years, these uh, isms have come about. And a few examples I've written down, and there's a little synopsis of each. There's existentialism, which uh, the only valid conclusions which can come from uh, uh, anything is the experience of the individual. So my experience uh, defines truth. Um, naturalism is another one of these uh, worldviews. It says, there is no God, and humans are just highly evolved animals, and the universe is a closed physical system. Postmodernism, you've heard that term a lot. There are no objective truths and moral standards. Reality is ultimately a human social construct. Pantheism. Andy, we talked about this. God is the totality of reality, and so we are all divine by nature. We're all a bunch of little gods running around. Pluralism is another one. More, uh, here's the one that, that I like the best, actually, and Pastor Aaron talks about this from the, uh, from the pulpit occasionally. He talks about moralistic therapeutic deism. You've all heard that term from the pulpit. What that is, is God just wants us to be happy and nice to each other. Uh, he intervenes in our affairs only when we call on him to help us out. Um, so these, these are just a few. I mean, there's nihilism, there's uh, relativism, there's all kinds of isms that are out there. And they are, again, anthropocentric. So they are man-centered, self-centered, uh, self-centric uh, worldviews, and they compete against Christianity. Um, one thing I can recall, just, this just came to my mind, it's not in my notes, but uh, in the Old Testament, you can see uh, pretty clearly that there are God's people, Israel, and then there are the, uh, the surrounding nations which war against Israel, um, the Assyrians and so forth, uh, the, the competing nations. Those competing nations war against one another. They war against one another. However, when uh, God's people uh, are, are involved or were involved, somehow they, they dropped their differences, whatever they were, and then they joined one another and came after Israel. So these, these competing views that we have in our culture now are doing the same thing. They're, they, they're, they're, um, they're exclusive to one another, aside from the fact that they're based in man-centered facts or, what, or assertions. So they compete and war against each other, per se, and unless Christianity speaks back or speaks into it, they all continue to fight. But as soon as, just as soon as, he, as Christianity begins to speak biblical truth, they will come together and attack Christianity. We can see that pretty clearly, I think, in our culture. And there's numerous examples of that. Maybe you can come up with a few. We'll talk about those later. But with respect to uh, worldviews, um, there are basic building blocks that um, uh, uh, inform or build a worldview. And these things, we call them, we call them facts or data. Uh, all the data that we, 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 we bring in and we synthesize, um, we, we take these facts and we build ourselves a worldview. We start that when we're young. Now, the kids, um, you know, from birth all the way up into, say, 12th grade or maybe a little beyond, their, their, their minds or their brains physiologically are still developing. But once that full development happens, that worldview, you know, is there. 
And that's where a person takes off and conducts their life. So the basic building blocks, data and facts, the facts, they orient us about what is. Uh, the facts don't tell us how what is or why what is, it's just simply what is. And so if you look at Merriam-Webster or uh, I've got a 400 year old dictionary, it's about that thick. I think it's the Reader's Digest Dictionary. I like to look at it because it's like from old days um, and words haven't been rearranged and changed uh, like we can see in some of the newer dictionaries. Anyway, that's a different, that's a different topic. Forget about that for the time being. The fact, uh, according to my dictionary, is something that actually exists or has actually occurred. Something known or proved to be true. True is the key word there. So when you look at true, that definition is faithful to fact. Truth and fact uh, have an intimate relationship. Jesus in chapter 17 of, of, of the book of John says, Father, in his high priestly prayer, he uh, says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then also in John 14, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pilate says, when he's about to crucify Jesus, he says, what is truth? God has given us the answer of what is truth. God is eternal God. He has spoken. He's the standard of truth. Jesus has just said it. Um, and as Christians, again, with the Holy Spirit living in us, we can only be convinced that God's truth is the truth uh, because of the Holy Spirit residing in us. You remember some of you were around last, uh, last semester when we were talking about the authority and the, uh, what was it, Andy? Inerrancy, infallibility, and sufficiency of Scripture. We were able to recognize, we were able to point out and recognize and remember that God's Word is truth. It's the standard of truth. And because it is the truth, it's trustworthy. It's more trustworthy than the anthropocentric or the man-centered doctrines that come from worldviews that are self-centered. Um, trustworthiness. That would be the basis of collecting the facts for your worldview. Now, your worldview needs work. How do I know that? Because my worldview needs work. It needs continuous work. Um, one thing that I'll never stop honking is that you all, we all need to continue to read our Bibles and study our Bibles, come under the teaching and preaching of the word. Because if you've noticed this, maybe you've noticed these little seasons or times in your life where you've been really into reading your Bible in the morning and preparing yourself uh, for the day. And then for some reason, things get busy. And then, uh, you know, maybe for a few days or a week or maybe even longer, you're out of the word. Um, I just need to remind you and myself that when we're not washing our minds with the Word of God, our mind is open to influence from everything else. All those competing worldviews that are barraging us through the television and through everything we see um, and experience, that is going to be influencing us. Whether you like it, believe it or not, it's a fact. Um, we are influenced and we take that data in and we can our worldviews can be reshaped by those things unless we are recentering ourselves around the truth. So how do we recognize facts? The first thing I want to tell you is that you need to be recognizing biblical facts because once you do that, you'll be able to discern and distinguish everything else. So the church has given us a lot of material. Okay, over the history, like, I, like I've told you, the, the, the church has, uh, the church has responded uh, to false teaching. I want to read something from 1 Peter. This is 1 Peter 3, and it's in the context of suffering. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect. So being prepared to make a defense to anyone, the church has done that and has provided us with a ton of biblical material. Um, the Reformation, that was a response to false teaching. The Catholic Church uh, had elevated itself 
to the same level or higher uh, uh, in terms of authority with scripture. All right, so the Reformation occurred because the Catholic Church was in terrible error. Um, the canon of scripture was, was put together because there were people saying that God still speaks. And we know that God has spoken. And that is about, sorry, something distracted me there. I'm easily distracted. Sorry, Andy. Thanks for doing that. <laughs> I got thrown off. Um, where was I? Oh, the canon. Yeah, the canon. Don't be sorry. <laughs> the canon of scripture was put together because, the, again, people had said, God still speaks, but he does not. He has spoken, and the canon of scripture is closed. That's it. And there are still people who want to say, in fact, there are people who have come through New City Church, uh, believe this or not, have come through New City Church and have uh, believed that very same thing, that God is still speaking. In fact, he speaks through me because I'm kind of a big deal. Um, I'll stop now. Uh, some of the things that we have been given by the church in the history of the church have been creeds and confessions, catechisms, and et cetera. Lots of things uh, have been given to us. Uh, biblical truth, reformed theological biblical truth. Uh, the most recent one that I can think of that in, in my research or my, uh, I don't know if I'd call it research, but in, in my looking for um, the things that the church has done for us and given us is the, it was 1978 or 87, there was a Chicago conference and they came up with a statement of biblical inerrancy. And they had to do that because again, the Bible is being called into question as being erroneous. It has errors and the Bible has maybe some, maybe some, well, we're not going to go into that. We've already done that. The Bible has no error. This is God's word. Um, yeah, so the church has given us a whole bunch of material. Another way that we can look for or recognize facts, and this is why I wanted you to get out your, um, your Bibles and your scripture, is to look for, and this is not a grammar lesson. I'm not looking to uh, be the teacher here in terms of, you know, an English class. You've all had English but there are a couple things that are, are really helpful in, uh, for me, and I want them to be helpful for you in terms of uh, grammatical structure of a sentence or, or a, uh, that you read or a, uh, something that you receive that you hear. I want you to be able to look for a couple of things. First, the indicative. Second, the imperative. And the indicative, it's, an, it's a statement. It's an assertion of what is actual. All right. It's an assertion of what is actual. So it's an assertion of truth. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind and had come to my mind is that, you know, Christ is the head of the church, is being the, the fulcrum there telling you that this is, an this is an indicative, right? Christ is. What is he? He's something. He's the head of the church. That is a fact. That's how you recognize a fact, a truth. All right. So look at Philippians. I asked you guys to pull up Philippians 2 a minute ago. I'm just going to read a, a portion of that verse. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So if you can recognize the indicative there, I'll give you a, a high five through the computer. Uh, but the indicative there, I think, is you see the word is, that's where you're going to see what is being told as a, an assertion of truth. It is God who works in you to will and to act. Okay. Ephesians 4. Verse 32, it says this. Be kind. Did I tell you the verses last time? Guys, you're not giving me any feedback. and I don't know if I told you what they were. It's, it's verses 12 and 13. I apologize for that. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Uh, so this one is Ephesians 4, verse 32. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So the indicative there is just as in Christ, God forgave you. That is the truth. That's the truth statement there, okay? That's how you can recognize an, imp or an indicative. On, in this, on the same token, uh, when, you, when you get an indicative, 
in these two verses, you have an imperative. So the indicative, the imperative. Indicative is, is an assertion, and the imperative is an authoritative command. So going back to Philippians, we look at work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Okay, the indicative, God working in you. The imperative, work out your salvation. So here's the truth, and here's what you do with the truth. Does that make sense? Yeah? Same thing with Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. There's your imperative. That's the authoritative command that comes from the indicative that, that's given in that verse. Okay? Not all verses, though, have an imperative associated with it. For example, the first five words of the, of the, of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. All right? It doesn't give you an imperative or command. There's intuitive things that come from that. Um, and we see what we are supposed to do. Later on, he gives us commands because of what he created. He gave us the cultural mandate, but it's not in that same verse. So you're not always going to find the imperative with the indicative. Okay? Again, this is not a grammar lesson. I'm not meaning to insult your intelligence. But uh, these are ways that you can find out the facts uh, as you read your Bible. Um, that's pretty much all I have, guys. We talked, I wanted to point out some of the, what time is it? What I wanted to do is point out some of the competing worldviews that are out there. Again, we don't have time for an exhaustive breakdown of all the worldviews and breaking down Christian uh, doctrine. Um, but we do have these things that can help us. We have our Bibles. You guys have these? You ever seen these things? Andy, you've probably got four or 500 of these uh, confessions. We need to hand these out for those of you who don't have them. This thing right here is a Baptist confet or a catechism. These are the things, these are the tools that we can and use, uh, can and should use along with our scripture uh, uh, to, to boil down things to facts from which we can build into our worldviews. There are competing worldviews out there, and it's uh, uh, it's it's a scary it's a scary place, folks. And uh, I want you to be secure in your Christianity. I want you to be secure in your worldview. Uh, we, as the leadership team, want that for you. So um, I'm going to ask Andy if he would turn the turn the sound back on, and we can um, either discuss as a full group, or maybe break out whatever you guys think you want to do, and just talk.